Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinemney.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome Tara Reidners. She's a nurse, dancer, and choreographer. Today's Kevin MD article is, America's nurses have PTSD. Will anyone listen to them? Tara, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. It's so great to be here. So let's start by briefly sharing your story and journey. Yeah, I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 25 years, and I'm also a dancer. I grew up dancing, and I have my master's in dance. And when I think back on my career, there's really three main moments that stand out to me. And those moments are the intersection of when my dance and my nursing came together and really, you know, also surrounded around some traumatic events. The first one being when my mother passed away and I decided to go back to school. I'd been nursing full time and I went and got my master's in dance. And then my sister got very sick and I used dance as, as a way of bringing laughter and joy to her. Mm. And then lastly, I almost died and was a patient for the first time from an ectopic pregnancy and had a really big realization of the need to care for our healthcare teams and to use dance and movement and the arts as a means to do that. All right. And today, tell us about that intersection between what you do as a, a nurse and dancer. How does that influence your professional career today? Yeah, so I am the CEO and founder of the Art and Heart of Healthcare Institute, and I bring together um, nurses, providers, healthcare teams, and create a, a space for them to share um, what it is that they've been holding. And we do that by using the arts as a structure. We play, um, we use movement, we journal. We have a, um, an incredible poet laureate who's on our team who comes in. Another team member is, has his uh, PhD in theater and play. And so our team really creates this beautiful space for people to come in and feel cared for, to create trust with one another, and to lay down a lot of the PTSD, the stories that have been living in their bodies for so long now. All right. Your Kevin MD article is titled, America's Nurses Have PTSD. Will anyone listen to them? For those who didn't get a chance to read that article, tell us what it's about. So I, as I've gotten deeper into this work, I have also, you know, looked at how nurses are experiencing PTSD and how, you know, all the things that we're holding, but also it, it begins looking to the root. It begins as, as nursing students and as medical students that were exposed to a lot of experiences and people mm -hmm. and trauma that we really don't have support to come around those moments. And so I was journaling and thinking of some of those moments for myself and this story that I had forgotten about came to me when I was working as a nursing student and, and was happened to have a patient who was dying of cancer and who was Spanish speaking only. And the doctor said, you know, there was nobody around who spoke Spanish. And I said, I do not really knowing what that would mean. And at that time, this was over 20 years ago, people weren't, there wasn't interpretive services available as readily as they are now. And so they asked me to go interpret and let this, you know, beautiful man know that he was dying of cancer and that he had less than six months left to live. And so I went in and, you know, being eager to please as a nursing student, wanting to do my very best, went in and, and shared that news. And I, I just remember how I had no idea that that story would impact me so deeply and how hard that would be. And, and telling this man and his wife and his, with the children present that he didn't have much time left and, and just experiencing the, the pain of him, him trying to stay strong, his wife trying to stay strong, and then watching everyone slowly start to break down. And I just kept remember just saying, lo siento, lo siento, lo siento. And I, I didn't know what else to do. And, and I, I, I think back on that and I wonder, like, was I the right person to do that? You know, and is there any, is there a right person? And I think, you know, maybe I was because I still had a lot of empathy. I still was coming alongside them and holding them. And, and I wonder if there's ways that we can continue to care and have that same empathy with, if we had more support for each other. So that was the basis. That story was in my body and I was just remembering it and remembering. And later, you know, my mother would pass away from cancer on mm -hmm. that same floor. And so that family came up, came to my mind multiple times as well during that time, which is, was in 2006. So tell us about how this story changed you. How did you use this story going forward to, to overcome some of that trauma? So tell us some of the lessons that you learned from that story. You know, the biggest lesson is just to share our stories to have spaces to tell the truth about what happened and to be with other people specifically who get it. So when I do these workshops for healthcare providers, 
the biggest thing that they say is, wow, I didn't realize how impactful it was to be in a room of people who understood what I'm going through. I could go home and tell my partner, I can tell my therapist, but when other people around me say, oh yeah, that happened to me too. I get that. That was hard. And I remember when I had something similar, you're not alone. The shame is released. Mm. You realize you're, we're in this together. So I think that was one thing that I, I think is really important that I learned is, is telling our stories. I think the other is, you know, tell telling the truth about what it feels like. I don't remember telling anybody how hard that was for me to be the person to say that. I don't remember sharing that um, and receiving care around mm. that specifically. And it would be great if people could ask and pull that out. But I also wonder if there's a space where I don't hide my feelings, where I come home from work and instead of swallowing my tears and saying everything was fine, I actually say, no, today was a really hard day. I need you to make dinner tonight. I need to go for a walk or really say what it is that I need. I, I think I, I have a hard time doing that. So outside of your workshops, do you think that nurses in general today are getting that space where they can share these stories with their peers? I think that we're on the edge of exploring it. I think we have peer support systems in hospitals, which are huge for, for these peer-to-peer -peer coming together to hear and use like psychological first aid to, to care for somebody in the moment when they're going through something traumatic. I think that's huge. I know there's different debriefing the front lines would be another organization who's using uh, spaces to debrief and come in de to debrief after hard situations or traumatic situations occur, sentinel events, things like that. But in general, I don't think so. I think we're still running from room to room, space to space. We aren't even necessarily aware of what we're holding because we don't have time to feel it. I hear that nurses all the time, especially during the pandemic or after the pandemic, they are tremendously short-staffed and the patient to nurse ratio are getting unacceptably high. What kind of stories are you hearing from the nurses who come to your workshops about what it's real like practicing on the front lines today? Yeah, I think 100% there's not enough nurses. There's a shortage. And I think one of the biggest things that I'm hearing is there's a lack of seeing nurses for who they are and what they're mm -hmm. doing. So I, in, during the pandemic, I was so frustrated at all of everyone asking us all in healthcare to stay resilient. We have to stay strong. We have to do it. And I was just like, that's putting the onus on us when there's like a larger issue here. And, and so I remember creating a word, um, rebrilliancy instead of resiliency, because what I want and what I'm hearing nurses say is they want spaces that are reflecting back who they are, who are nourishing them, who are nurturing them, who are caring for them. And that's what rebrilliancy is, reflecting back and remembering the brilliant and resilient humans we already are. If that's our starting place, then what we're doing is we're tilling the soil for them. We're being mindful about the places we're planting them in and we're watering them, we're feeding them. And that's how we grow. Instead of this version of resiliency where we're the one flower that blooms through this you know, cracked concrete and we're honoring and praising that, that individual overcoming, what I'm seeing is that when we can come together and care for each other and create spaces that honor each other, we can take on a lot of hard things. It's not that nurses are scared of hard things. We can be short staffed, we can do it, but we need, we need to be in it together and we need to have a supportive environment that honors us simultaneously. Well, tell us a story or a scenario where a nurse had that breakthrough moment, where that togetherness kind of really helped her through that proverbial PTSD that he or she may have experienced from the healthcare setting. It could be from your workshops. It could be from a, a story that you heard outside your workshops. But give me an example of, of a breakthrough a nurse had just by being able to share with their peers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so many beautiful moments and stories of, of people breaking through. And I think, you know, I can share one of a, of a male nurse who, who said he, you know, came into the workshop thinking like, I wonder if they're going to ask me about this one story because I don't really want to talk about it. So I'm just, I'm going to already make the choice that I'm not going to talk about it. And, and we talk about our grief stories in our workshops, but first we play, like before we even get to that deeper part, we play together, we experience joy together, um, we laugh together. And so we create this space of trust. Um, and then we ask, you know, them to write their grief stories. And we start with this, um, 
prompt, I remember when, after that, I, in the future, I hope. And so, you know, like I said, he was like, I'm not going to tell that story and he actually wrote a completely different story. And then when we got into groups and began to share, he said, everyone was sharing so vulnerably about these stories that had been living in their bodies that they don't really get the chance to share. And, and he started crying and he told his true story. He said, I wasn't going to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it because thank you to everyone else for yeah. like laying that out. And he told the story of how he um, lost someone during the pandemic in the same hospital that he worked in and how difficult it was for him to come back to work every day and to take care of patients because it constantly reminded him of his loss. And so this like, you know, zippering of our per personal lives and our personal losses alongside our patients losing and the secondary traumatic and post-traumatic stress that's involved in that. And you could just see the relief as he was telling the story that he hadn't shared with anyone. And we do this thing where we come around and we put a hand on people. So there's like maybe six people in a group. And so he's standing in the middle and we're all like putting hands on him and watching just the tears fall and watching him be cared for in it. And so that moment is, is like sacred, right? Like that priceless moment of being able to share your heart, tell the truth, show your true emotions mm -hmm. and have your colleagues come around you and hold you. Like that to me is, that's how we heal. And I love this quote by Bell Hooks. Rarely do we heal in isolation. It's when mm -hmm. we commute together with one another that healing takes place. And so I, that to me was an example of, okay, this is healing. This is what it looks like to have trauma, to share it and to be supported. So in your workshops, when you open it up by having people more comfortable around each other, by activities that simulate play, what are examples of that? So one of our colleagues, Dr. Claire Hamora, like I said, he has his um, PhD in play and theater, and he leads us in this really beautiful play. So it's really silly. He comes up with a storyline. This last one was about, we were astronauts and NASA called everyone here because mm -hmm. they were on this adventure together and, and everyone's like, okay, I'm in. And nobody really knows what they're in for, but we're all like, let's do it. Why not? And so we eventually, you know, turn off the lights and create blue, beautiful lights and these flashing lights and we create astronaut costumes. And so all of a sudden we're basically in kindergarten again together, finding boxes, wrapping tape around us, helping each other. And we're not even thinking twice about it. We're just creating these outfits to go to space and nobody knows why. And it just brings out the childlike heart and the silliness because there's nothing at stake here, right? So as providers and nurses and clinicians, there's so much always at stake and there's we're in life or death mode, fight or flight mode. And in this mode, we just get to play and be together. And it's um, very low stakes and it can be hard for people, but mm -hmm. everyone for the most part jumps in and is in it 100%. And, and then we have, we go to space and we have a dance off and people are, dancing and some people are doing the worm, like the craziest things happen in this space, in outer space. And it just creates a, a real deep sense of joy, like deep laughter. And some of the participants have said, you know, this is the hardest I've laughed in years. Like I don't ever remember laughing this hard. And I think that when we let ourselves feel the depths of our joy, we mm -hmm. also allow ourselves to feel the depths of our grief and vice versa allows us to, to feel. And I think I say that in the article of once I realized I was hardening my heart and desensitizing myself, I couldn't turn it on or off. I became desensitized to, to everything around me. Now, what kind of message do you have to your fellow nurses who may be listening to you now, who may not have the benefit of attending your workshop? What can they do to overcome some of the trauma that they've felt or seen at work? I think the first thing to think through, and I'm still learning this, is redefining resiliency for yourself to take away that silly individual flower in the concrete and think of um, think of like the underground union that Ross Gay talks about in his book, Inciting Joy, and this underground embrace that happens with aspen trees, um, what that looks like, the softening that we have to do to tell the truth versus the hardening and bouncing back. Um, I also, when I look to nature, you know, I invite people to to this to fire ants because there's this really beautiful thing that fire ants do when when the floods come. So like mm -hmm. when the hard times come, what they do is they hold on to each other like mm -hmm. with everything they got, and they create this like really beautiful boat that's 
can only be created because they're holding each other and everyone's holding on for dear life. And then when they get to a reed and they can climb up it and have a moment. And then when the waters come, they go back into the boat. So I wonder to my fellow nurses and for myself, like, what does it look like to hold on to each other as though our lives depended on it and caring for each other in that way? Because I, I really think that at the end of the day, our lives truly do depend on it. And what's your message to healthcare institutions so that the onus of overcoming the stress isn't solely on the healthcare workers themselves? What's your message to the institutions themselves? They need to implement peer response programs, debriefing programs, and they need spaces like the workshops that we do outside of work for people to come together for eight hours and to be with one or to lay down their grief, to, to like mine these stories that have been in their bodies and in their bones and do it with one another. And so that those pockets that they create from mining can be refilled with joy so that they can come back refreshed and ready to to hold more and because that's the ask every day right for us to mm -hmm. hold and to continue to hold more and more and at a certain point we can't hold anymore unless we release and care for ourselves and so it's it's asking the systems to not just put self-care on us but to create spaces of collective care where we're caring for ourselves but also caring for each other simultaneously and paying us to go to them <laughs> We're talking to Tara Reidners. She's a nurse, dancer, and choreographer. Today's Kevin MD article is America's nurses have PTSD. Will anyone listen to them? Tara, we'll end with some of your take-home messages to the Kevin MD audience. My take-home messages, I, I think it's the, the softening, how to find space and spaces to soften. Who are we grabbing onto? Who, who are our fire ants that we can hold tight to in the midst when hard things come? And the dance of giving and receiving, that it's really hard to receive, but to really think of ways that you can open yourselves up to receive more as you're co constantly giving and giving. And that we're the systems, like cis healthcare systems are created of people mm -hmm. and that we, we can be the change in the systems the more that we allow ourselves to receive and create these spaces of healing for one another. Tara, thank you so much for sharing your perspective and insight. And thanks again for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Kim.